Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And I'm Christopher Fan Kaufman. And this is the podcast for January 22nd, 2023. And I, would, I wanted to say a word of apology from us. Uh, last week, we reran an old podcast because in the... Um, Oh, and just all the complications of life, we thought we had recorded more than we had. So, uh, we are glad to be back. And uh, so, uh, the this picks up, this podcast picks up the Beatitudes uh, midway through January in the season of Epiphany. And Christopher Fan Kaufman, uh, before we started, uh, before we push record, said the most complicated text in the entire Gospel of Matthew. So, Christopher explain yeah the difficulty with the sermon on the mount first of all it's a very long sermon we often take the beatitudes and cut them off but really it goes from chapter five all the way through chapter seven so just to know that we're dealing with a smaller chunk out of kind of the largest block of jesus's teaching in the gospel of matthew but it's difficult because we get so many images thrown at us today by Jesus, kind of one after another. And so you could spend a whole sermon on any one of the phrases of the Beatitudes, any one of the images that Jesus uses in this section. Uh, but to try to take them all together is a, is a tall task to chew on. So again, that's what I, when I say complicated, I mean, we have a lot to think about and a lot to discuss in this. So I just want to set us up for that as we begin. Yep. A word of context before we go further, and that's to note that uh, two things are different in terms of the narrative lectionary about how we approach this as opposed to like the RCL. Um, the first is that we do have three weeks in a row on the Sermon on the Mount. So we have a week on uh, the first 20 verses of Matthew 5, then we've got some Matthew 6, then Matthew 7. But even so, even the fact that we go all the way through verse 20, and that is the second thing that's different. It's not just the Beatitudes. I was... Uh, uh, I, I overspoke when I said it's the Beatitudes. It's also salt and light, the law and the prophets. Uh, what we do miss in chapter five is the uh, the so-called antitheses. You have heard, but I say. But so we do have, uh, we do take a little bit larger chunk this week. In also setting context, I always like to put uh, this sermon in back into its narrative context of Matthew. Um, and it's following a teaching um, from Dallas Willard, um, which takes a look at the last uh, few verses of chapter four, or what would be uh, the scene that is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew before the sermon, uh, where Jesus has been healing and they have been bring, bringing persons from all over Syria to see Jesus and he's been healing their diseases and uh, casting out demons and, and, and healing ep epilepsy as well as teaching. And uh, Willard, uh, Dallas Willard said that in that context, Jesus is giving vocabulary to the experiences that those who had been healed had just had. So you've had this incredible encounter with Jesus that clearly has changed your life. How do you describe it? And Jesus begins to say, blessed, blessed, blessed. And then to call that out, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who, um, uh, the pure in heart. Uh, blessed are those who are meek, merciful. Each of these terms begin to capture the awe of having experienced the shalom of God, that completeness of healing and wholeness and um, lifting that, I just don't know how to put words to, and Jesus gives a vocabulary for it. I love that way of entering into um, just the Beatitudes and uh, agree agree that um, we are talking about more in um, what I call uh, for some of us the red letter portion where Jesus just seems to go on and on and on. Uh, but uh, 
there were a lot of people there and um, there were a lot of different um, learners who needed different imagery to understand. And, and, I, and I would share the interpretation that uh, Jesus probably taught these things in multiple locations and in, in, in multiple um, repeated them. Um, so the idea that these are Jesus' uh, best hits um, or the most familiar of his word, um, that, that rings true, I think so, I think as well. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Joy. That was very eye-opening in the sense that so often with the Beatitudes, the the question that's often asked is, who are the blessed ones? Who are these poor? Who are these who mourn? And to point to the fact that uh, they're right there. These are the ones who have already experienced Jesus and now are getting not just healed, but talked into the reality of the kingdom, I think was very eye-opening. So thank you for sharing that. I've often done the same move. Uh, I didn't know Dallas Willard did it, but my interpretation of it is slightly different because it says they brought to him the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics. He cured them. Then he goes up the hill and he says to the disciples, and I think he's saying to the disciples, who are these people? The sick, the demoniacs, epileptics, right? Right, all the freaks, all the all the all the disabled, uh, like myself, you know, uh, who uh, who are left out. Uh, who are they? And then Jesus says, "Blessed are, blessed are," teaching the disciples how we are to regard those um, on the margins. Mm -hmm. Another piece, uh, and and I appreciate that, Rolf, because when you read that first verse, it does say that Jesus saw the crowds and went away. And there are many texts where in the midst of all that Jesus has done, he steps aside. And in some of those texts, he steps aside to teach his disciples. Uh, so I, I, I agree with that reading uh, as well. And I appreciate yours to state that Jesus has given that vocabulary um, uh, for who these blessed are. Another piece, uh, and I'm just going to rely on Dallas because I can name who taught me this. Sometimes I have a thought and I don't know where I got it from, but this one, I, I, I know where it came. Um, and, and the other piece around that is this idea that we have a tendency to speak the promises and never deliver. And whether Jesus is speaking to the crowd or merely to the disciples, he is articulating what action has already occurred. And it might do us well to practice before we proclaim, rather than making promises we never fulfill. Pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. I also like, I, that's great. And uh, talking about the setting, whenever, whenever I think about the Sermon on the Mount and this idea of a crowd at the base of a mountain and Jesus going up the mountain, and we talk about the way in which there's some Moses imagery, the idea of Moses going up on Mount Sinai. And I think it's very interesting in that context and with what you just said, Joy, to think of the way in which the Beatitudes and the Ten Commandments interact with each other. And the way in which the Ten Commandments, we see this in Luther's small catechism, when they are thought of as commands for serving the neighbor, the way in which this blessedness interacts with that service of the neighbor, I think is really can be a powerful way to approach uh, these mountain scenes. And so I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up. And a reminder that in the narrative lectionary, we had the Ten Commandments in the fall. And so that's one of the pairings that's intentional. And, and when you think of, and, and uh, we'll say this in the weeks to come, but as you think of the ways in which Matthew is rehearsing scripture that has already been uh, in the imagination of the first century readers of the Hebrew text, uh, and so for us in our preaching, I, I would encourage our, our listeners to, to teach this as a trajectory, not as simple principles, but as uh, a forming of community. And this is the trajectory and they grow on one another rather than being isolated ideas. <laughs> 
Can I? Um, you guys just made me think of something that I don't think I've ever thought about. I mean, so obviously one of the one of the um, one of the ways that the uh, the beatitudes develop is blessed are they, blessed are they, or those, and then it culminates to blessed are you. When and then it describes a case when you're not going to feel really blessed when you're reviled and persecuted. Um, so what do you think that does, especially if we start with, OK, here's here's all these people that people don't consider blessed or look up to. And Jesus, if Jesus is saying blessed, they no, no, they are they in the kingdom of God, they are seen. One thing that immediately occurs to me is the. You'll sometimes hear it said, you know, how blessed the disciples were that they got to sit at the feet of Jesus and so forth, uh, whereas we don't have that opportunity. One of the things that I think is interesting about this is that Jesus is already telling them right at the very beginning of Matthew that this is a temporary situation, that you will be with me for a very short time and that you need to be prepared for what comes afterwards. And here uh, is exactly what will come. People will persecute you and revile you on account of my name. And so be prepared for that. And I think there's a good analogy here to the way in which, especially within American Christianity, there is a tendency to think of church as the holy space and then uh, to kind of set that aside, uh, sort of like setting aside the time with Jesus, with the disciples, when in reality, uh, there is a sending out, there is a going out into the rest of the world uh, without uh, without Jesus present or right there. And there's a need to prepare people uh, to go out from the church and to go out from their pews. And as you said, Joy, to uh, make good on those promises. And the, and I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate that question. Uh, when we get down to... Um, uh, verse 13, the you are the salt, you are the light. Um, and then uh, 17, where I didn't come to abolish the law. Um, uh, in each of those, again, there's this trajectory, um, which I appreciate, Christopher, you putting in the sense of here we are now, but this will not last, but this will would be what comes after. But Ralph, as you asked the question, I think um, the first thought that came to mind with that is um, this um, uh, challenge, I guess I would say, uh, that when these things happen, um, to hold on to, gosh, I all I can say is the responsibility um, and, and the idea that heaven is not something pie in the sky when you die, but the glimpse of the promise, what later on Jesus will say, the kingdom of heaven is near. The glimpse of the promise is here. And now every time you or others experience healing, wholeness, completeness, um, freedom, um, liberation, uh, all of those things that will, will, will be the shalom that, that is the creator's original intention. And, and so it's a challenge to live that out in a world where you're going to be the minority. You know, doesn't take a lot of salt to make a real big difference. Um, and the other thing, uh, a friend of mine preached a sermon a few years ago that just really described salt. So if somebody wants to play with that verse alone, just learn everything you can about what salt is and what salt does and, and the impact salt has and know the value of salt then. I mean, um, it's it's a commodity. It's a it's of great value because of its necessity, um, and and to understand that, uh, and then to realize that Jesus is saying, "You are that little 
huge um, difference in the world. Uh, it, it's a challenge to say, you might feel like you're the only one, but you just need to be the leaven in the loaf to change metaphors because as Christopher reminded us, there's so many here. Uh, but that, that, that's, what, that's what your question made me think of, Rolf, that, that this is heaven on earth. <laughs>